So, my name is Robert Sandel. I work for Sona Mobile Communications, and I'm going to talk about how we maintain our Jenkins clusters. Uh, before I get into the good stuff, uh, I, I need to uh, sort of go quickly through some of the ways of, of how we work with development of our software so that I can sort of use sort of some terminology later on so that you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a team slave, for example. Um, then uh, go through a bit of how Jenkins and Garrett, how we have put up the topology uh, around there. Um, and then finally, uh, what, how we maintain Jenkins. And if there is time, I'll talk about some bumps in the roads and some of our future plans as well. Uh, first, a shameless plug. So my friends call me Bobby. Uh, on GitHub and on the IRC, I'm known as R. Sandel. I work at the development environment section within software development and Sony Mobile. And we sort of take care of the tools that are used by the software developers. So we're mainly um, integrators, maintainers, developers of tools. So for the developers part, that is the source code management, IDEs, emulators, compilers, build and CI, some verification tools etc. Um, and we are divided up into sub teams that are sort of responsible for each uh, subgroup. And my, my team is called Build and CI. So we take care of the different build tools we have as well as Jenkins. And I am the tool manager, i.e. besides coding, I also prioritize the backlog. Uh, in the community, uh, together with my colleague Thomas, I'm maintainer of several plugins that we have contributed. For example, the Gary Trigger, Build Failure Analyzer, Multislave Config plugin, just to mention some. Okay, so this chart I just put up here to scare you. Um, but it's quite an old picture as well, but it sort of shows the flow of how how a piece of code is running through our tool chain. Um, you can see that it's old because the name Hudson is over there to the left where I say that Jenkins is. So th then you can date it somehow way back to 2010 or something. Uh, we focus mainly on open source tools. Uh, try to use that as much as possible. We also have some homebrew uh, and some proprietary tools like Coverity Prevent uh, those kinds of things. But you don't need to learn this. I just put it up here to show the complexity of it all. So this is a sort of high level of a typical workflow for, for how a, a change is made. We're using Garrett as a code review system, uh, as well as source code management uh, based on Git. And as in most Garrett installations, uh, you upload a change and that change needs um, approvals. It needs a verified plus one and a code review plus two. And in our setup, the only user that is allowed to vote a verified plus one is Jenkins. Um, so someone, you upload a change uh, that that change or, or a patch set, uh, and that becomes a change in Garrett. Uh, and as the user uploads that, Jenkins triggers one or several different builds that runs and verifies. And if, if those builds pass, Jenkins will set a verified plus one. Uh, at the same time, he adds some of his teammates or peers to do a code review. And if they are pleased, they vote a code review plus one. If they are, have some comments, they put a minus one and say, could you fix this? They can also apply, uh, vote a minus two, but that is about the biggest insult you can give to an engineer. Uh, so that happens quite rarely. A minus two basically means your life as an engineer is over. Please get job flipping burgers. Um, so, I mean, if, if you have some comments, maybe you should fix this. 
and stuff like that, you put a minus one. Um, and once it has a plus one, uh, it, uh, it goes to the next step, and that is that a subdistribution architect that is responsible for a larger piece of the code like graphics, networking, that type. He, he is the one or she is the one that then looks through it one quick time and um, votes plus two and then it gets merged in. So some of the typical builds we have in, in uh, Jenkins is uh, we have a build farm uh, that supports sort of building in general and also the Android emulator. Then each team has also different slaves at their desks or close to their desks where they can plug in phones. And, and those slaves are then connected to Jenkins so with either just scheduling directly uh, on the slave or with a label they can run their builds and tests on an actual phone. Um, so those are mostly sort of a nightly build or a daily build that goes on there. But some teams even have when a change is uploaded to Garrett, they are actually running on the phone or they can choose to run in the build form on the emulator or they choose to run both. Um, so the jobs that, are, that, that they typically have is for an application, for example, is that it flashes the latest version of, of the Android platform onto the phone. It builds the application, or either the change that was made or if it's a nightly build, uh, takes the head, uh, installs that on the phone as well, and then run whatever test suites it is that they have. Then for each, let's say, uh, cluster of integration branches, <laughs> uh, there is one team that is sort of responsible for, for the overall system itself. Uh, we, for simplicity's sake, we can call them the release engineers. Uh, they are also providing nowadays a full, for, so for each change that is done in the Android platform, we are uh, they have builds that are triggered on those and built just to see that, uh, that there is actual build being done that can be done on that change. So those run on, um, on uh, some specialized hardware with SSD disks just to get up speed using build cache and stuff like that. So instead of a one hour build, we have maybe have 15 minute build instead. The system team is also the ones who actually do the, the release builds, what we call official builds. Uh, so these are full builds and packaging of, of the platform. Uh, they are labeled, uploaded to the binary repository. These are built several times a day, maybe five, six, depending on, on uh, how much work is being done on that branch. Um, so, and these are usually multi-configuration projects. So one step in the pipeline is actually building all the variants. So uh, one axis is maybe the phone model. So for example, the Xperia Z, the ZL, and the tablet. Uh, and then we also, the, there is also the variant. Is it the engineering build, or a user debug build, or a user build? Those are basically different debug levels of, of the system itself. So that can become quite a big uh, matrix from that. And then after these builds are done, the verification department has their own jobs that are triggered by a successful official build that runs smoke tests on that version of the software. So these are Jenkins masters worldwide. Um, we have one set of masters for each major developer site. Uh, in the beginning, we only had one master per site. Uh, the, the one that we nowadays call regular. So you can see, for example, on the Learn site, we have the uh, Jenkins regular at S-E-L-D. That's Sweden Lund. 
Um, and these are, uh, yeah, so at one point we decided to split up uh, to sort of spread the risk of if something broke, we shouldn't sort of break everything. So we decided we, we took and broke out to have one master that was, um, that, that handles mainly platform builds and then the other master that we now call regular is the one for everything else basically. Uh, and with that, we can then take down the number of plugins that are installed to limit the risk of that failing. Uh, and Tokyo took a slightly different approach and created a separate Jenkins master for the release engineers or for the, for the system team that we call now. We, we used to call them configuration managers, so that's why it's called Jenkins CM. So, and I think Envy or something, but now we have a CM server in Lund as well. So now we have a platform for all, all the teams to build their platform builds and stuff like that. We have a one master for, for the CM, the official builds, and then one regular that runs everything else. And these are what our IT department call a mid, medium sized server. So they are, running on 24 cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, the Jenkins CM is on a later version of that same uh, medium size. So now when we order them, we get 32 core, cores and 128 gigabytes of RAM. And if we take a look at the Lund servers, those are the ones that I handle most mostly. Um, so for the regular server, there are 300 slaves, 70 of those are team slaves, so those are the ones that are spread out throughout the, uh, the office space. Uh, we're running 99 plugins at last count. Uh, we have about 5,000 jobs on the regular server. Those are produce 6,000 builds per day and collects about 350k tests per day as well. So if you see on the platform server, for example, in Lund, it's zero tests per day, but that is actually what we are running more tests. It's just that Jenkins doesn't collect those. The, the, those tests are for platform and those are mostly uploaded to a separate system. Um, so you can see a slight difference between, between them. A little less, only 70 plugins for the platform, 70 plugins for CM as well. Um, and it's quite a quite young server, the CM server. It only has 400 jobs. It, it's only been there for like a couple of months. So, and similar on, on the other sites as well, uh, in terms of storage and size. Tokyo has a bit larger with a 10 terabyte storage. Well, we are suffering with only six terabytes. And for the rest of the presentation, when I'm showing numbers and stuff, that's mostly from the regular server in Lund because that's is the one that I'm using the most. Can we take questions afterwards? Is it okay? Yeah, great. Okay. So this is how how we have set up Garrett to sort of handle the load from from what we do. So th there is one central Garrett. Uh, review server in the center up there and all the code is pushed to when we sort of push code you push to that and uh, the review server is then in turn replicating out those changes to to its replication slaves uh, so we have I've lost count I think we have like five or something on uh, on each site depending on on load uh, and then the Jenkins master is connected to the review server to get events from Garrett, like a patch that has been uploaded and those kinds of stuff. And then the slaves themselves are set up to fetch code from a load balancer. Uh, now this load balancer is only, what it does is that um, 
it's, it, it is balancing on DNS records. So when, when the IP for that server is requested, it looks at which Garrett server at the moment has the lowest load, and then it returns that IP address to, to the client. So we're actually not going through the load balancer, we're just finding out which other Garrett slave to connect to. Uh, the servers that we're mostly running are on Ubuntu 10.04, the LTS version, and we are currently upgrading most of our slaves to, uh, to the 12.04 LTS version. And the picture down here in the corner is from um, our, a part of our build farm in, in Sweden. So these are uh, yay big shuttle form factor I think we pay like 200 bucks or something a piece for them. Um, they are either four core or two cores hyperthreaded, or they are eight core machines with varying between four and eight gigabytes of RAM. Some have 16 as well. Some of them on the side might have an SSD disk in it for speed. Okay. So we have what we like to call an open configuration policy. Um, so if a user can log in, and basically anyone within development is able to log in, then they can create and configure jobs. They can delete any job or any build they want. They can run any build they like. They can basically do anything except administer go in and manage Jenkins, that's about it, what, what they can't do. Uh, also, the main views are restricted to, to maintain, maintainers only. Uh, we also have some certain power users or privileged users that are, also has uh, the possibility, besides ourselves, to, to maintain uh, Jenkins. And those are mostly our release engineers, they are able to go in if a slave is behaving badly and it's an important build that is going on, they can actually just disable, they can disable that slave and restart the build without that slave being there. Uh, the jobs themselves are mostly freestyle or matrix jobs with tons of bash and Python and Perl scripts all over the place. Um, so then most applications are, are done with our in-house plugin that is building with our in-house app uh, tool, build tool, that we call SEMC build, because we used to be Sony Ericsson, so Sony Ericsson mobile communication build. So that, that is what is building our applications and we made a, a plugin on top of that. Uh, we have templates that we uh, provide them with, but as I've heard on, uh, on other talks here is that deviation occur quite quickly because they might start off from a template and change some things and then for the next project they just copy the previous job and then for another branch they copy that job and make small changes. So we end up with a, a, a lot of job, jobs that are basically the same, but slight variations of them. Uh, and most teams have one or two uh, users that are sort of doing the Jenkins stuff. Uh, we encourage them to, use, to the users to use a naming standard. We do not enforce it explicitly, but we, we sort of please use this naming convention because then it's easier to put it in a view or we can calculate some metrics on it. Uh, I don't know if the resolution is, is good there, but the, for example, those jobs down in the corner there, it's prefixed with Garrett, meaning that the, this is a job that is triggered by Garrett, then it's the branch that it's aimed for, and then it's the whatever module or application coming afterwards. Okay, so now we come to the good stuff. We have split up the responsibility of, of, the, of the maintenance into three parts. We have the IT department that are the unsung heroes of, of, uh, of, of this thing. They are sort of responsible for everything from the operating system and down. 
So they are making sure that the slaves and the, and the servers are cool and connected to the network. They replace and upgrade hardware. Uh, they take care of security patching and all that stuff that is needed for, for, the, for the operating system. And from time to time, we have a power outage, and then those, those are the guys who run over and stay all night trying to get the cluster up and running again. And then we have applica the application management team. Um, they are sort of handling both Garrett, our binary repository, and Jenkins. And they take care of the day-to-day -day work, uh, like user support, uh, managing Jenkins, what, what is needed to, for the upkeep. Uh, they, usually Jenkins is the one that is reporting bug errors or build errors. And, but it might not be Jenkins' fault, so, but they are the ones that sort of take the first line support, check, is it Jenkins' fault? Is it the build system? Is it, was the network down or whatever? And then send it on to whoever is responsible for that. And then there is the team that I belong to. The, uh, we sort of, we are the second line of support. Uh, we do larger development work on features that that is needed. Uh, we try to plan ahead uh, and not only do firefighting. Uh, we handle sort of user requests, do, we do training, and also we engage with the Jenkins community, like what I'm doing today, for example, or hang on the mailing lists or an IRC contributing plugins that we made. And sort of the AM team, they sit like six steps away from me. So we have daily communications with them as well. Okay. So handling these like 300 slaves per master or what is it, 600 slaves per site, uh, we have a lot of automated maintenance scripts. And the first problem we need to solve since we're not using the cloud, we're using physical machines, is that disk space runs out. Um, each slave, normal slave, has a hard drive of either one or two terabytes. Um, and some of our pimped slaves are running on, on only 240 gigabytes of SSD. An Android build of the platform is about 50 gigabytes. The SDK that is downloaded for, for an application to be able to be built is about 1.5 gigabytes. Then each slave also has a Git reference mirror that is about 100 gigabytes. It's pending between 80 and 90, depending on where we are in the project at the moment. And that adds up to quite a lot of gigabytes. So we have, on, for, for the slaves, we have a, a periodic job that runs on the master every hour or 30 minutes, depending on what type of slave we need to clean. And it goes through and sort of connects to the slave, checks if the disk space is below 80 gigabytes, I think we have at the moment. If, if it isn't enough, so 80 gigabytes is, is enough to sort of make at least one Android build. So if, if it's not enough free space, it deletes all the workspaces from the jobs that are not running at the moment. If there are no builds running on the slave at the moment, it's safe to delete the temp directory as well, and also uh, the SDK. Because, so we consider the workspace sort of volatile, that because the builds can run on sort of any slaves at any time. So the, the workspaces can live for maybe a few hours after a build is done, if, if we're lucky. On the, on the small to 40 gigabytes, maybe not that much. On a two terabyte, the, the, those can maybe live for days, depending. And then on the master as well, we only have six terabytes of storage. So we, we need to make sure that, that, we, can, that we have enough space to, to archive the artifacts. Uh, so we also have a cron script that is running on the master once a day. It makes sure it checks that it's 20% free space. 
And as long as it doesn't have 20% free, it removes the oldest artifact. So, and that makes, the last time I checked, we can keep build artifacts for about two weeks. Uh, if, the, if it's high season, maybe only a two days or something. Uh, but we, the, the script always makes sure to keep the latest artifacts at least, but you should consider your artifacts to be volatile as well and upload them to a separate server if, if you need to store them. And I don't know, but I see this quite often, that a slave goes offline because it has too low disk space. So the, these scripts are sort of trying to avoid that this happens so that we have a, uh, up, enough uptime. Okay, then we need to keep the slaves up to date as well. Uh, we need to make sure that it has the latest, ver the, the versions they are supposed to have of all the tools, of all the libraries, uh, and all that stuff. And on the OS part, of, we use CF Engine. But CF Engine is updating maybe each 15 minutes, checks that, that it has whatever it needs. We used to use Puppet on the eight, Ubuntu 8, 10 days, and that couldn't handle the load at all. Uh, it could take days for a package to, to reach all, uh, all of our slaves. So CF Engine handles that a bit better, but still a bit uncertain on, on when a package is actually available. Uh, and we, as, as I said, we don't want it to be, up to, to be updated in the middle of a build. If we, it happened one time that we actually changed the string library to a newer version in the middle of, of a release build, and that broke the build. So we have actually turned off CF Engine, the, the agents on all our slaves, and each night we have um, uh, a script that is running on, on each slave that puts the slave as temporary offline. You can click the little button there. We do it with the script. So that the, when the slave is marked as temporary offline, no other jobs will actually run on it. And then it waits for, for any build to finish on that slave. Then it runs CF agent. It runs app get upgrade. Uh, and then apt-get is also putting a flag to see if, uh, to say that we need a reboot or not. And if we need a reboot, we make sure to sort of add a force FSCK on next reboot and then we reboot. So we, we sort of get a free FSCK on, on, uh, as we do that reboot as well. And then we put the slave back as online. Uh, and that will do so that Jenkins itself, when it notices that everything's booted up, it can actually launch the slave. Uh, when we launch the slave itself, we are using execute command on master, uh, that setting. And what it does is that we have a directory on the master that tells that these are the scripts and the Java versions and some other small stuff that, that you need. And it, or syncs that over to the slave, and then it executes java-jar, slave.jar. So every time a slave is launched, we, the maintenance scripts and those types of stuff that, that we need are actually synced out to the slave before launch. And then we have the git reference mirror as well that needs to be updated. And that is updated each night. So each night we have a whitelist that has been calculated from all the gits that has been, that has had any work done on it the last three months, for example. So we, we know which gits we want to bring down. Um, we do a Garrett Ellis projects, that means we list the projects that, we, that, that are available on the Garrett server. So, and that, so Garrett will then actually just return the list that we know we have access to read and then compare that with the whitelist, and from that we get a bunch of gits that we then do a git clone dash dash bear and put that in on, on the slave. And that path is then set as an environment variable that we call repo mirror. So when you do a repo sync or a git clone, you can use that with a dash dash reference. And that means that 
when you do a clone in your build, you're actually only downloading the changes that has happened since last night's mirror update. And the rest are just soft links into the mirror. So we're, we're only sort of downloading the delta, but according to Git, it's a full repository, even though you've only downloaded the delta. Some uh, maintenance of how to sort of survey and measure so that we know what is actually going on. Um, so each night, I think it is, we have a slave sanity script that is running. It sort of, this script is basically a collection of everything we have discovered over the years that has gone wrong. Uh, and it checks to see that that hasn't happened again. Uh, let's see, so for example, it checks that we, it's 80 gigabytes available on, on the hard drive. Uh, it checks that there is at least one gigabyte available in the temp directory. Um, is, there more, is there more than one instance of slave.jar running? The, uh, checks the connection. Yeah, it's sort of, th these are just some of the examples that we're uh, checking. Is the slave pingable at all? Stuff like that. Slash TMP read only, that can happen if you have a read error and Linux decided to remount it in read only mode. So, and then every morning, the, uh, the one of the guys in the AM team is actually going through the checklist to see which of the slaves survived the night. And then we also have a, a similar that, that is going through a specific sets of, of, uh, of the known packages that we need, like the build tool, uh, the Python version, our assign tool, uh, just to make sure that the, it is a homogeneous version across all the slaves. And th those can also be sort of flagged if there is a discrepancy there. So the morning ritual is sort of check the, check the logs of these builds and, um, and take care of whatever has happened, might have happened. Over at the far right, uh, you can see we have a script that is running every 10 second that is going through and checks the, uh, how, how many executors are used, how many executors are available, and how big is the queue. Uh, not sure you can see, but there are sort of green spikes going up. Uh, so these are for 30 days, and those green spikes are every midnight. Then the queue sort of becomes huge for, for all the at midnight or at nightly jobs that are scheduled. But they are sort of disappearing quite quickly, so th there is a lot of blue here, and that is actually free executors. Um, but for some reason, we feel that we have a too small cluster anyway, but that, that is because things are running for so long. But there is still a lot of error in, in our 300 Jenkins slaves that, that are on that build node label. So they, they, these are the graphs that I, could, that I got the information before about how many builds and how many tests that are being executed. So the, this is a, a job that is going through all the builds that has been done the, follow, the, the current day uh, and counts them up just so that we can see sort of how is the trend uh, going. On the far right is, is, the, uh, is the cause of the build. Uh, most of those, as you can see, are actually timers and Garrett. So either, so we have about as many as many Garrett triggered builds as we have actual, actual nightly builds or daily builds. So the, the, these are a good way of sort of seeing where the trend is going and so we can plan ahead on, on if we need to buy new hardware or not. Okay, so I thought that might, maybe all of you don't know how to install a plugin. So I wrote down these six simple steps of uh, how we install a plugin. First, make sure that it's open source so you can check the source code. Uh, we, you start to go through and just see, does it have any global hooks in it? Does it have a run listener? 
an item listener, maybe maybe a queue sorter is in the plugin, or page decorator. And these sort of give you a hint of how much impact will this plugin have on your Jenkins master if you install it. Does it do any big iterations? Does it do get items and iterate over those? Jenkins get items is basically just the list of all the jobs. Uh, does it list to get computers or uh, get builds, etc.? So they, this sort of gives you an indication of uh, will it sort of how, how hard it will impact your system. Uh, we also sort of get a general feeling about the code. Is uh, how complex is it? Does it have any unit tests? Does it look like crap or not? Have you seen the crap for J tool? It's quite awesome. It looks through code, uh, the code coverage versus the complexity metrics, and then it tells you if it's crap or not. It's quite cool. Uh, it's not no longer maintained, unfortunately. <clears throat> Uh, but so, so, so this step, the, the first step is basically just to go through and see doing a risk assessment of how much testing do we need to do. The next step, we usually install it on a local instance on our laptop or on desktop computers and play around with it to see that, does it do what we want it to do. Um, and that, then we install it in our test environment to see that it actually plays well together with all the other plugins, all the other 99 plugins that we're running at the moment. Uh, see how it behaves there. And this is, these are the tests sort of that, that we make here on the test servers are based on what we found out in, in step one and two. Uh, then, depending on the risk we see, we might install it on one of our production servers and run it there for a week or so to see uh, how, how the impact is. And if that turns out okay, we deploy it worldwide. But you're, you're not safe uh, yet anyway. So we still keep a paranoid eye on it for maybe a week or so. Uh, and then we, we can sort of treat it as part of, of the entire system. Okay. Um, some of the plugins that, that are, could be quite handy if, if you're handling this type of big systems. We created the multi-slave config plugin because we sort of, we bought slaves in bulk of like 100 and 150 slaves at the time and it was kind of, quite tedious to, to sort of point and click, install, add new DOM slave, give it the labels. So, so the multi-slave config plugin is good for handling sort of batches of slaves. If you want to change maybe 50 slaves at a time, uh, change the label of those or something like that. Um, the section view plugin, we use that to communicate news, like the very important mandatory fun day uh, that we have each Friday. Uh, also, if there is some problems uh, on a general uh, way that, like, Garrett is down in, in Beijing for, for today, please hold on, stuff like that. And Scriptler, if you are looking for a superhero power that is achievable, I recommend the uh, Groovy uh, console that, that is in Jenkins. For us, uh, a reboot time is could be between 40 minutes, maybe. Uh, depend, it has been that in the past, at least. So rebooting Jenkins because of some small problem that we have, it's not really the first go-to thing that we do, but we actually try to fix it in runtime. And, and doing Groovy scripts done is, is your savior. So, and Scriptler is a very nice plugin where you can actually save your Groovy scripts in a, in a catalog on the master. And it's also quite nice because you can share Groovy code scripts uh, with others in the community. So we can do quite good debugs. We can quickly go through and get some statistics out of Jenkins, stuff like that. Uh, the job config history plugin, probably well known. Uh, we use that quite often to blame someone. Uh, who, who broke a configuration for a, of a job, for example, or check out the previous version that actually worked. And we also use the job config history plugin to actually n see who is actually owning a job, because we cannot see who created a job, but we can at least see the, the persons that, that configured it last. 
with disk usage plugin is also a nice way of finding what jobs that are taking up most space on in terms of uh, artifacts for example and and i think it also does workspace size i'm not sure and then we also another plugin that we have created it's called the build failure analyzer and we created it for the for the the jobs themselves so it's it's basically a big knowledge base of of regular expressions uh, that sort of quickly can find the cause if it's known why a build failed and it displays that directly on the build page so you don't have to go in and dig through the log but we also use this for st statistics so we're actually tagging each cause so that we can see if how many environmental issues, how, how many problems we have with Garrett, how many problems are Jenkins related, and then we can sort of attack those in a, in a planned manner. Yeah, and I think I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. Or I can, yeah? Yeah, so if, if we can find stale jobs, that, that uh, yes. Yeah. So what you were asking is basically if we can detect and find jobs that are no longer in use or that that has become stale. Um, so we have uh, once a year we have what we call spring cleaning, uh, and we have this quite big groovy script that goes through and goes through sort of some of the rules. Like we have the naming standard. So we can see on, on the job name if, it, if it's for a branch that is no longer being um, supported, for example. It's past the 18-month date that we have for some. Uh, it also looks through and see, it, it checks stuff like, uh, is it building, has it, uh, does it has, yeah, like, different things that we know about, like uh, is it building every night but it fails all the time? That is a quite good indication that nobody is caring about this, that, about this job anymore. So we have a couple of different things that we look at. The job config history plugin is quite nice because then we can see when it was last edited as well. So th there is a Groovy script that is looking at these things and then it moves all, all the jobs that it has found as a candidate and moves that to, to a specific view that we call the trash can view. And then we tell all the users that we have put a bunch of jobs in, in the trash can view, please have a look and see if your job is there. And if we don't hear it from them in, in, within two weeks, we delete everything in the trash can view. So last time we, we ran this script, we removed 4,000 jobs. <coughs> And we, uh, so, so that, in, that lowered our startup time with 30 minutes, maybe. <laughs> so so, so that, uh, that, that is the way that, that we sort of try to find out. Because engineers are lazy. They are not removing the jobs themselves. They are hoping that we are doing it, or they forget. So yeah. Uh, so, this, uh, so how many executors we have per slave? So for the slaves that are running in our build farm, we have one executor per slave. Yes, one. No, um, on an average, I would say that we have three executors per slave. Uh, some have five. Uh, so, but sort of the bulk is the build farm, and that, that, that only has one executor. And that is because the emulator is quite hard to configure it to run on multiples. So we make sure they only have one executor so that there is only one Android emulator running at the time. Um, also, the platform builds themselves are actually utilizing all the cores on the slave. So that would just be a waste to run two platform builds at the same time because they, they're very good at, at utilizing all the, all the cores. So, so when I talk about slave, I talk about basically uh, uh, executors as well. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh, that's a Good question. If we if we were to go with the cloud, the the problem uh, that I found so far with virtualized slaves is that our builds are very very I/O intensive. 
There's a lot of small C file and H files and jar files that are being created and Java docs and all that stuff is, is taking up a lot and lots of IO. And the virtual technologies that we have tried so far is quite bad at, at IO. So that's why we, we have chosen to go. And that's why we are still, still keeping to, to these hardware as close to the metal as we can. Um, I would guess for, for the application builds, we could probably go, go uh, virtual. But, but, but we, we haven't found a cost-effective way of going cloud or, or virtualizing stuff because we need a lot, a lot hotter hardware in order to go virtualization. So. What? Sorry? Yeah, so, so the team slaves has, has though that would be hard to, to plug in a phone to, to a virtual machine, but it's possible probably. Yeah. Overall, I'm, I'm not sure how many developers that are actually sort of in the Jenkins UI, but I mean, everyone is affected by Jenkins and I think we have around, we have a, above a thousand uh, at least, so maybe 12, 2000 developers. So many people that are managing Jenkins. So the AM team has one dedicated person that is taking care of, of the daily Jenkins work. Uh, on the dev side and the build and CI uh, team, we are uh, six people where two are doing mostly Jenkins work. But we're sort of, yeah, so on effective on a day-to-day -day basis, we might be three on the application level and then the IT department have whatever guys they need at the moment. So how we do LTS installations or testing, basically what you're wondering. Uh, we're going with the LTS of, of the core. Um, we, we're basically keeping an eye on, on, on the dev list and see what, what is happening there, which version that is tried at the moment. Um, and then at some point in time when we know we have a maintenance window available, we spend a couple of weeks before testing it in our tests. Basically the same thing we do when we install a plugin that I showed you before. Uh, we run it in our test environment, we have a test suite that we go through, and depending on how we feel confident or not, we, we maybe do one, one master, we, we upgrade and see how that works, and then we roll it out globally afterwards. So keeping an eye on the change log, and keeping an eye on the dev list, and, and in Jira, and just what plugins we are going to upgrade. Um, we, in essence, we have once a month, uh, the IT department has decided that we need to do a, a, a patching of the operating system. And at that time, we, we sort of decide to, to do an upgrade as well. And what we usually do is that we upgrade, first on the test servers, all the plugins that has a new version available and just go through quickly and see if it works. We, we basically rely there that, that no one is really breaking stuff. And then we just upgrade all the plugins. New plugin inst installations are, are more tedious, uh, but we just upgrade and, and pray, basically. And if stuff breaks, we roll back. Yeah, okay, thank you, that's all. But I'm, I'm available over if you have any more questions.